This program is brought to you by the Center for a Sustainable Today. Our world is an amazing, complex living organism, and we coexist in a symbiotic relationship. With this great power comes a great responsibility, a responsibility to ensure the future by taking steps to be sustainable today. Here is the host of Sustainable Today, Jean Bauman. Hello, and thanks for joining me on Sustainable Today. For today's show, we're rebroadcasting an interesting and informative program from the 2007 lineup. Hosts Marsha Willard and Darcy Hitchcock explore the issues and impacts of toxins in our environment. But before we get to that, I'd like to point out that this program is produced by the Center for Sustainable Today, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the education and promotion of sustainable practices across the board. In addition to TV programming, the Center also engages the community in improvement projects to further the principles and practices of sustainability. Now one of those projects is the Atkinson Park Project, which enlists volunteers to clear invasive species and maintain the park to prevent the use of chemical pesticides. Another project is in association with City Repair and their annual village building convergence. Recently, the Center unveiled a new bus shelter in Oregon City. The Trails Crossing Project brought together volunteers and businesses to provide Oregon City with a unique and welcoming structure which employs green building techniques, a rain catchment system, and a permaculture garden. At the dedication ceremony, Project Director Gordon Westfall was joined by the leaders of Christ the Healer Church and Mayor Alice Norris who praised the project. You created something lasting and sustainable and linking form and function, linking art and, uh, and usage, linking people in really wonderful ways. So it's with a great deal of pride that uh, on behalf of the citizens of Oregon City, I am participating to help dedicate this in perpetuity for, uh, for our community. Now, if you would like to know more about the Center's projects or to learn how you can help the Center carry out its work, please go to sustainabletoday.org and click on the Outreach Bubble. And after today's show, please take a few minutes to give us your feedback by going to our website and selecting the TV Program button. There you'll find the Click Here to Take Survey link. Thanks again. Your responses will help us bring the stories and information you most want to see and know. And now, please enjoy our program on toxins Here's Darcy and Marsha. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us again on Sustainable Today. We're so glad you could join us. This time our show's about toxics in everyday products that may end up in your body. So I think you'll find the show really interesting. I'm Darcy Hitchcock. And I'm Marsha Willard. And this evening we have on the show with us Molly Chidsey from uh, Multnomah County. Thanks so much for joining us today. Before we get into the show, let's, um, uh, the meat of the show anyway, shall we talk about the news segments that we came across? It seems like every, every time we talk about climate change, it's been such an important topic lately. And um, this time there's uh, some more bad news, I'm afraid, and that is there's a new study out that shows that the rate of the um, greenhouse gases increasing has actually accelerated um, from, um, they looked at the period um, during the 1990s and then from 2000 and 2004, and it's increased uh, significantly during that time. Why is that? What's, uh, well, I thought we were paying attention to this. Why is it going up? Well, part of it's because of China. They're um, obviously mm. industrializing, and they, a lot of their power is coming from coal-fired power plants, which generates a lot of CO2 and lots of other pollutants as well. So that's, that's uh, upsetting. And, um, you know, the entire world just keeps gobbling up more and more fossil fuels. Now, in our last show, we bragged a little bit about what Portland is doing, and, and we've been able to reduce our carbon emissions by a little bit. Is it, is it going down anywhere besides Portland? Well, it's interesting. The article mm -hmm. that I saw um, listed different parts of the world, and some of them were growing up, uh, 
growing very fast like Asia, including China, mm -hmm. but it looked like um, in Europe it was level or just a little okay. bit down. So um, where there are good policies, <coughs> where there are people who are paying attention, you can still have a very fine economy and be able to, to control climate change. We okay, show that so here. That's the important news, is that yes. it's possible to do without doing damage to the economy or our yeah, lifestyles. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Well, so okay. what did you come across? Well, um, we have the solution to your problem. Oh, good. <laughs> I noticed that in Oregon here that um, the uh, legislature just passed an energy bill that's going to require 25% of our wind to come from renewable resources from uh, by 2025. And so did that pass in the House or the Senate or both? Yes. Both? <laughs> yes, apparently there were different, slightly different bills in each the House and the Senate, but they're both going to Kulingowski, the governor, and he's likely to sign them, and, and that's going to happen soon. And so this should take effect um, fairly immediately. There is some concern about what it might do to energy prices, uh, but the anticipation is that it might just increase them by about 1% or so until the markets mature and get, uh, get stable. But 25% is very demanding. There are 23 other states that have similar legislation, but but uh, I think Oregon's is one of the highest uh, percentages. So, so maybe we'll see different report in that in that research that you encountered in a couple years. Well, we... I certainly <laughs> hope so. I also came across a number of different um, news segments that relate specifically to our topic mm -hmm. about toxics. Um, mm. One that I saw um, was around uh, common chemicals are now clearly linked to breast cancer. The rate of breast cancer has been increasing, and there are more than 200 chemicals that are found in the air and in products right. that we use all the time, and they've found that they do cause breast cancer in animal tests. Um, and I didn't realize this, but breast cancer is the leading killer of U.S. women in their early 30s to 50s. The leading killer. Um, so it's it's serious. You know, we keep having the race for uh, the cure. We need the race for the prevention. Yeah, and that's an interesting statistic about it being the the number one killer because heart disease is also on the on the rise with uh, within women and other populations. So, what was also scary we're about dying faster and faster. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It seems, it seems confusing to me, and that's something I'll want to ask Molly, is that we seem to, um, our longevity, we seem to be living longer, but yet that we have all these weird chemicals. But one of the things that I found uh, worrisome is that almost all of the chemicals that they were talking about are mutagenic, which means they change the, the DNA. So it's not just it makes you sick, but you can pass it on to your children. Mm. It's now changed. Um, and that's, that's very scary. There's also a Yale study that showed that even though the air quality on the East Coast was in compliance, it, uh, it, um, there were enough, enough toxins that affected the birth weight of women's uh, babies. And um, obviously, low birth weight leads to all these other health problems mm -hmm. that happen after that. So even though we're, you know, the EPA says it's fine, it's not fine. We need to be concerned about that. Well, they're in compliance with the things that we know about. Yes. And now we're learning about a lot of different things. So, so my, I found some articles that, that uh, answers the question how they get into your body. Oh, that's good to know. Um, and uh, there were a couple of uh, articles that I found about uh, what's showing up in our water system. And, and one article talks about the impact of, in particular, the PCBs, which we've talked about on previous shows, which are flame retardants. I'm not going to try and pronounce the chemical name, <clears throat> but they're showing up in water, and the, the article is about the threat to wildlife, particularly birds. But it seems the, like we haven't learned a thing since Silent Spring. I mean, uh, Silent Spring, when did that come out? In the 60s, the book that, you know, was saying DDT was, was killing off stuff, and, and it was accumulating in all of these animals and working up the food chain, and it seems like we've just changed chemicals. Yeah, we have. We have, and, and you know, if, <laughs> even if you don't care about the osprey that they're targeting, it's like the canary in the coal mine. I mean, right. we're, we're getting the same thing, too. And then the other article is about our local rivers, and it lists this, the eight local rivers where they tested for um, the, some of these chemicals. And you know, just some interesting things about, yes, we do drink a lot of coffee, and now we have the proof that it's show, caffeine is showing up in the water, which doesn't sound too dangerous, but when you look at these uh, other chemicals listed, they're, they're mostly pharmaceuticals. Uh, of the 13, almost half of them are mood-altering, uh, antidepressants, and things like that. So at like least that. the fish are having a good time. Yes, well, they should be because they're also being feminized, so they're not... 
having a good time in the other sense of the word. So <laughs> we're changing. We're changing. So the women's movement has yes. finally <laughs> made, made a difference. Yeah. So well, we, we may get our wish for a world without men. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> on another note, so yes. so those are you know I'm hoping Molly can tell us what where this stuff is coming from, other than the drugs that we're taking, uh, because uh, not that many of us are taking antidepressants. I don't think so. It's it's, it's worse than. Than you think. I guess so. Anyway, <laughs> let, let, let's bring Molly into the conversation yeah. since she actually knows what she's talking about. <laughs> so thanks for being on the show, Molly. Would you? Um, yeah. You're, you're, you're representing Multnomah County today for us, and so would you tell us a little bit about your position there and sure. the work that you're doing for of us? Of course. I work for the Multnomah <clears throat> County Sustainability Program, which is a pretty small program, uh, primarily focused on making county government operations more sustainable. So we work on a wide variety of projects ranging from green building for county facilities like libraries and health clinics. I work primarily on toxics reduction for um, how we own and operate facilities. I also work on recycling and some sustainable purchasing stuff. So today you're going to tap my brain about um, what I know and can would like to share with you about toxics and toxics reduction. Great. We're eager to hear it. Well, you know, I can't when I first found out the, the synthetic chemicals that are in our bodies, I was so shocked. We have uh, fire retardants, we have industrial mm -hmm. solvents, we have wood preservatives, we have, you know, all of these things in our body. And at the same time, life expectancy seems to be increasing. So I can't figure out whether we should be concerned or not with all this stuff that's in our body. So um, there's this term I've heard, body burden, which mm -hmm. talks about what's in our body. Tell us a little bit about that and what, and what you know about it. Okay. Well, you know, toxic chemicals can be either man-made or human-made, or they can also be naturally occurring. But uh, those do often get into the human body, sometimes through water, like you talked about mm -hmm. before, but we can also mm -hmm. inhale them, or we could sometimes um, get them through the skin, through products that we use or things that we touch. So there's multiple different pathways. Um, the term body burden actually just refers to the total amount of those chemicals that are in the human body at any one time. So it sounds a little bit gross, and, and it <laughs> is, and it really does vary from person to person. Um, there's been some good studies recently that show what those kinds of chemicals are, but the scientists really do, um, what we do know is that um, everybody alive today has some of these toxic chemicals in their body in very, very low amounts, but mm -hmm. it's kind of the accumulation mm -hmm. of all of them. What are, what's the soup that's, you know, what's the, um, what could they possibly do together? The synergistic oh, effects yeah. aren't, aren't yeah. well known. There can be up to 700 chemicals in somebody's body at any one time. 700 chemicals. Mm -hmm. So where are they coming yeah. from? Well, we're not really sure. Um, they come from products. I uh, also and you've should, got some here. Yeah, actually. I do have some here. There's, um, you know, the main point so is that we don't really tell know us for about sure. Some of these. Absolutely. Well, what you've got in your hand there is a very common household product. I, actually, I have some myself. Yes, I know. I, I recently had to give up one that I loved myself. It's just a nonstick pan. Uh, it has a coating on it that, when heated at high temperatures, can actually um, is toxic in a way that might kill uh, a small bird if you had a bird for a pet. Uh, it also, wow. so you talked about canary in a coal mine. It's kind of the modern mm. version of that. Okay. Wow. That's something and, that we're working on. And these, we've got three minutes, so I'm rushing you. Oh, I, my gosh, when you touch yeah, it. Yeah, these are the blinky shoes. Sometimes they have a, a mercury switch inside. Very popular item. This is a... And mercury causes brain damage, right? Yeah, mercury is a neurotoxin. It's pretty potent, and a lot of people mm -hmm. know about mercury, but you don't know it might be in your shoes. So, yeah, yeah. they're still on the shelves out there. Um, a lot of water bottles have a plastic a that's... A lot of water bottles. Everybody mm -hmm. I know carries one of those. Uh, they're very popular. It's made from a plastic called polycarbonate, and uh, it's good for lots of things. It's very hard and durable, but when it becomes scratched or old, it can actually leach um, toxic chemicals into the water or beverage inside. So like when I put it in my dishwasher, I'm doing damage that... Yeah, you're you know. damaging the integrity of the plastic, essentially. And then my favorite, the yeah. vinyl shower curtain. Yes, this is pretty common. And um, you know the reason why vinyl is very soft is because it contains uh, plasticizer called phthalates. And those off-gas, that yucky new shower curtain smell is actually phthalates. So there's, I brought, brought these in today because they're pretty easy to find less toxic alternatives for that are pretty affordable as well. I've heard that a vinyl shower curtain <clears throat> loses half its weight in the first three months that it's hung. Huh. It because of, of what it's off-gassing. Mm -hmm. 
And so there is no it. away. It mm -hmm. goes into the air and mm -hmm. into your lungs and onto the dust moats that you know find mm -hmm. their way around your house. Hold and your so breath forth. when you shower. That's right. So I thought I thought we had governmental agencies that protected us from all this stuff. So what's mm -hmm. the deal there? We've got about a minute. Okay. Well, I'll tell you. You know, we do have some federal policies like um, U.S. Toxic Substance Control Act. It's a little bit of an older policy from 1976, and it does a lot of good, but it doesn't require that chemical companies perform basic health and safety tests on their products. Yeah. So it's a really exciting time now because mm. other countries are starting to step up to the plate and develop new policies like the European Union um, REACH policy actually just went into effect today. It's a very exciting really? day. Yeah, June 1st, 2007. So that's been in negotiations for a while. And the really exciting thing about REACH is that, um, you know, chemicals used in products will have to undergo basic health and safety testing. And, and then there'll also be more information available about those products. So REACH stands for Registration, Evaluation, and Authorization of Chemicals. Seems like some common sense stuff. I think most of the public would be shocked to know that this doesn't already go on, that we don't yeah. test products. The bias is that it must be safe until it's proven otherwise, and that's mm -hmm. led to all of these prob problems that we have now. Well, you know, children are really an important issue here because mm -hmm. they're little, they absorb, they eat, you know, the amount of stuff that they eat, for example, per body weight mm -hmm. is much different than an adult. They're growing, and so all right. those things are important. So we'd like to um, uh, take you to the Oregon Environmental Council because they have this great uh, new program called Eco Healthy Child Care. The goal is for Oregon children to live and play in a toxic free environment and so this program encourages businesses and uh, and governments to reduce the use of toxic chemicals it also helps parents and caregivers make choices that will protect their children from toxic chemicals even before birth um, we need to do that the same way that we protect our children from smoking and so so on. Um, declines in asthma, learning disabilities, cancer, and other health problems that can be triggered by pollution are some of the things that we can uh, fix uh, through doing this. This is an extensive program that's won awards, and April Westfall will explain the program for us. the Rowan Berry School in Northeast Portland. And with me here is Sarah Leverett from the Oregon Environmental Council, as well as Angela Malloy Murphy, founder and teacher here at the Rowan Berry School. And thanks so much for coming today, April. Oh, thanks for having me. And we are here because the Rowan Berry School has been chosen as an eco-healthy school by the Oregon Environmental Council. And I'm very curious uh, what some of the standards are and uh, why they might be important. So the Eco Healthy Child Care Program, it's actually, it's, it focuses on child cares as well as schools like Angela's. Um, and it rewards and endorses facilities that are committed to reducing kids' exposure to toxics. Um, and the program works by um, facilities looking at a list of 25 best practice points and if they comply with 20 of those 25 points to reduce kids' exposure to toxics, we endorse and promote them as eco-healthy. Great. Well, I would love to um, take a look at the school here and see how the school has met those uh, standards to be an eco-healthy school. Let's so check it out. All right. <laughs> Come right along. This is the entryway, and this is where we take our shoes off. Oh. And why do we do that? Uh, the reason for that is it just doesn't bring contaminants into the school environment. I think it's one of the points on the OEC checklist. Yeah, it is one of the points. Um, it's a great way to keep dust and contaminants out, as well as lead, which is a big issue in Portland. Um, older homes that have been painted with lead will, as they deteriorate, um, generate lead dust. And so as you're trekking around outside, you'll bring that in, and lead, of course, is very harmful to developing brains. So it can actually things. stick to your shoes. Yeah, wow. yeah. Uh -huh. um, and depending on how much lead paint has been used in that area, or if it's in, near a traffic zone, um, you can actually bring in a significant amount. No kidding. Wow, well, that's good to know. I think I'll start doing that at home. All right, let's come on in. All right. This started out as just a really unusable works. basement, and... 
wanting to have a home school. My husband helped me. He was the contractor and the builder, and he helped us build it from the ground up, literally. And because he has the same values as, as myself, and we have children of our own, he used as many um, natural and non-toxic materials as he could. So the paint is low or no VOC, um, depending on the room. I noticed you don't have any any wall to wall carpeting either. Yeah, we try to avoid the carpeting because of all the off gas. And the rug that we're sitting on is a wool rug. It's all wool. It's wonderful. And why, why wool over a regular carpet? The big benefits to wool is that you have there is no off gassing. Um, it's naturally flame retardant. It naturally is antimicrobial, so it it's a cleaner product naturally instead of having to add a lot of stuff to it. It also won't trap, not having the wall-to-wall -wall carpet, it won't trap a lot of the dirt and dust um, and things that get drug in from outside. So when the kids are down on the floor playing, they're not going to have a lot of the uh, particles coming into their lungs. So I'm noticing that these toys, they look like they're all wooden, is that right? I'm wondering why you might choose wooden over the you know, the conventional, typical plastic toys that you usually see. The thing with these toys is they are an investment to begin with. I hear a lot of people say that they don't feel that they can afford wooden toys for their school or for their home for their children, but it's, it's an initial investment, but the toys really do last forever. Mm -hmm. If they break, they can be fixed, unlike a lot of times if plastic toys break and it's manufactured, it just goes in the garbage. That's right. And not only is it made with wood and painted with yeah. natural paint, but oh, it's sealed with beeswax yeah. instead of polyurethane. And it takes a little more maintenance with toys like this. I have some natural sealant to go back and periodically continue to seal it so it doesn't, it's not affected by moisture. But you can smell the beeswax on a lot of these natural toys when you're playing with them. It's really a beautiful smell. I think plastics are thought of as something that can be cleaned, that can be washed and disinfected really easy, easily, and that's mm -hmm. why they are used so much in childcare environments mm -hmm. because they can just be run through the dishwasher. Mm -hmm. But we do wash all of our wood toys. Uh -huh. um, and and how do you what do you wash them with? Well, a little bit of grapefruit seed extract and mm -hmm. just scrub it and then get it right out of the water and let it air dry. Nice. Some things like this do, they just eventually break down, mm -hmm. whereas something like this never will. Right. Um, so this is, the most plastic we have in the room is for the tactile tub because this stuff just sits in water. Uh -huh. But I'm starting to find more and more um, steel things, and I see this a lot in child care centers. We've got a ton of plastic for our water play. But I'm finding more and more that there are things we can replace those with. Oh, nice. That aren't plastic at all, that will hold up to the water. What you're looking for with plastics is avoiding number three, number seven, and number six. Um, number three is going to be PVCs, and the ones we're concerned about are the softer PVCs. Mm -hmm. So like a rubber ducky frequently will be number three, and um, will have something called phthalates in it, which is not good for kids. You can identify number three by the soft vinyl. Mm -hmm. um, number seven, hard, clear plastic. Uh -huh. So, it's like in sippy cups, for example. Sippy cups and baby bottles, um, some of them have them. But same price, same function. You can get ones that are milky or opaque colored that don't have, um, in number seven, it's bisphenol A, which, again, is increasingly linked to health issues in children. And the hardest part is that it's hard to tell which toys are the safer plastics mm -hmm. um, because manufacturers aren't required to label it. And mm -hmm. also, depending on where it's from, um, you know, if the toy's made in China, a lot of times all the ingredients, it doesn't even occur to them to include that in the process. Mm -hmm. A lot of toys these days aren't made with the three or the seven. Some bigger companies are committing to not using bisphenol A or number three. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you, you do have to be aware of it, and it is up to the consumer to really find out. Unfortunately, sometimes that means calling the manufacturer and asking because they aren't labeled, mm -hmm. um, or choosing products that are explicitly labeled. This is my 16th year as a teacher, and I've had plastic dolls the whole time because children love all over them, and they get really germy, and it's, it's really easy to just sponge those down. And they were the soft, squishy kind, just like what you're talking about. And it's only been in the last couple of years that I've gotten these guys. They are wool, mm -hmm. and so they actually retain the child's body heat.
they sure, just treat them in a really different way than they treat those plastic dolls. Mm -hmm. And we're able to just sort of sponge bath them and treat them with a lot of care to make sure that they stay clean. They hardly look used at all. I mean, wow. Well, they just treat them very gently. Mm -hmm. Just watching the way children treated those plastic dolls, you know, they ended up outside or thrown down, and they really treat these like treasures because they are. They are obviously handmade by people. And I think they watch the way I treat them as well. And mm -hmm. so they, ha they get the sense that it's really something to be revered. Mm -hmm. So, Angela, you spoke about um, using non-toxic cleaners to clean the toys and, and the classrooms. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what you have here. Sure. Uh, this is the stuff I wanted to show you because it's, it's pretty easy to get access to these things to come across them. This is grapefruit seed extract, and you can get it at a health food store. Um, and you can, if you smell it, it's just, it has, it's just, a, it's a really strong concentrated um, citrus that can be used to disinfect toys or to clean with or to wash dishes with. This is our soap. We just make our own spray soap for the children to use on the table. Uh, this is surface spray and this is what we use um, to spray the room. It's an all-purpose antibacterial spray that's herbal. And you were talking before about things, Glade-type disinfectants that you plug in the wall or candles that you burn. No, um, they both use chemicals that um, to bind scents that aren't good for especially developing lungs, but also um, they frequently put out small particles that can get deep into lungs and even pass over into your blood, so it's wow. um, wow. better not to use them. And this just smells better. <laughs> this is cinnamon and eucalyptus and tea tree oil. And then another thing people do um, is just boil a pot on their oh, stove nice. with water and apples and cinnamon just to mm. make the whole house smell like, you know, something tasty. And Dr. Bronner is, is for everything. And, and that's a mostly a Castile soap, is that right? Liquid Castile soap that's natural? Yes. Mm -hmm. And we can use this with a little bit of water to dilute it, not much, just for the children to wash their hands with mm. in the bathroom. And uh, these are the products that we use to seal the toys. And this is just pure liquid beeswax. And it's a little different than just melting down your own beeswax to do it, as we discovered. <laughs> um, it's just formulated in such a way that it's nice and liquid that it's gonna stay liquid. And you can use it to seal any unfinished toy or sand an already finished toy and reseal it with this. And as you mentioned earlier, there are a number of recipes people can make on their own um, using baking soda and vinegar, borax, lemon juice, things like that. So going back to you know what our grandmothers did in cleaning, you can both save money and have a lower toxic cleaning regime. Mm -hmm. chemicals, um, chemicals are used in pretty much everything we do these days. Um, in a child care facility, art supplies, you know, the smelly markers that you know smell like orange and blueberry and what have you that I loved and played with as a child, turns out can be an asthma trigger and does interfere with lung development. Um, these are the watercolors that we use. The paint uh, is plant-based or plant-derived. It's not completely derived from plants. There are other brands where the paints are completely from plants. Mm -hmm. This has other elements to it, but it is completely natural. Like the crayons we use are non-toxic, just like any of the crayons you'd get in a grocery store are non-toxic, but the difference is it's made with real beeswax rather than a petroleum-based product. You just actually smell the beeswax as you're coloring with them, and it's just something really subtle. We may associate doing art more with the scented markers you mentioned earlier, the, the sense of our childhood, but they say that smell is the closest link to memory, and when children are doing this, they are setting those patterns, natural smells, as things that smell beautiful and right to them, and then they'll recreate those in, in their patterning when they're buying art supplies for their children. Um, I think Angela's done a really fantastic job. Um, on our checklist, the, our best practices covers everything from non-toxic cleaners to air quality issues, um, inside and outside the facility, um, playground equipment we make recommendations on. Unfortunately, a lot of wood is treated with something called CCA, which is meant to prevent the wood from rotting or from pests get, from getting in it. Um, but this 
product or this chemical um, actually leaches out of the wood and it leaches arsenic. So when kids are playing with it, mm -hmm. they are playing on um, equipment that is leaching a chemical, which they then get on their hands. And then if they go and eat, they'll ingest the arsenic, which of course is bad for them in a lot of ways. Um, fortunately, there are a lot of great alternatives that don't cost more and um, are just as good for building play structures. Um, in particular, cedar. Um, it's a wood that naturally is rot and pest resistant. It was made for children, so of course it's safe or safe enough. It should be fine. And then around the time we were doing the OEC standards, looking down the checklist, uh, I realized that we had an opportunity to seal it with, with non-toxic sealant. Um, my husband added this element up here for the treehouse and the sandbox, and as it grows and we add wood to it, we just purchased a, a non-toxic sealant, and so now the whole thing has been sealed with that instead. If people have a pest control problem, they'll frequently defer to a toxic uh, pest control. But there's really no need for pesticides in the garden. Um, what we do is plant companion planting. We have some slug catchers here. They, they love to eat the slugs. If we catch the slugs, we'll often go over to the coop and feed it to them. And they'll eat the worms too, but their contribution to the garden is so great that we'll let them get a couple worms if they want to. Their manure is the best stuff you can get. Just makes really rich compost. And they eat our weeds too. We pick the weeds and feed it to them. We have the bunny manure and the chicken manure that we use. Um, it makes a compost tea. And then we have uh, the leftovers from our organic snacks right back there in the corner is our compost bin and we get compost out of that. It tends to make plants that are so healthy that they're more disease resistant to begin with. Nice. And if you get sort of out of the cycle of using, you know, Roundup and the things to, to spray to keep away the pests and just have really, really healthy, rich soil, then you're growing plants generally that you're not going to need those for anyway. So Angela, thank you so much for having us here at the Rowan Berry School. It was great to have you guys. Thanks. It was a lot of fun. And, Sarah, and there's so much to learn. And thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. And I'm April Westfall here with Brain Stew Productions, bringing you the tools to be more sustainable today. Well, we're back in the studio here with Molly Chidsey from Multnomah County, picking up the conversation where we left off. You were telling us about some of the things. You were scaring us about some of the things <laughs> that we're, we're exposed to. Um, so tell us what's happening in the U.S. You alluded to some of the European uh, initiatives. Mm -hmm. What's happening for us here in the U.S.? Well, I think this is a really exciting time because I think we're starting to see uh, a, a shift or a, a tipping point starting to approach, or maybe we've already gone across the tipping point. Right, so we've got so. some good news to report. Um, in the U.S., there I'll talk a little bit about clean technology or clean tech as a business sector. You, know, you might have heard that as a kind of a new buzz phrase, mm -hmm. but um, so manufacturing that makes products that is that are non-toxic or that are less toxic and better for human health and for the environment. So just a couple of quick facts on the economic side to show that we're really headed in the right direction with this stuff. Um, Massachusetts companies in the 1990s, this is a, a tough uh, yeah, study, uh -huh. and they added up all of the <clears throat> amounts of money that businesses in the state saved during the 90s just through basic pollution prevention, toxics reduction efforts. And they actually saved about $15 million. So it might not sound like a lot now, but consider that, you know, that was a decade ago when things were just kind of getting started. So I'll give you a more recent example. Um, the clean technology sector for venture capitalists, so folks that really put, you know, a lot of money on new things that they see are a good bet, if mm -hmm. you will. Right. Um, that is actually uh, clean technology, something in like maybe the top five 
uh, different industries that are being invested in in the past year and that was a big increase over the previous year and it's something like three trillion dollars in investments wow. currently and, and on the rise. So It's really exciting when the market gets mm -hmm. involved yeah. with making a difference. And that's not just people who are trying to do the right thing. When you get that kind of mm -hmm. money it's because people have faith that it's uh, economically viable. That's right. That's right. Exciting. Mm -hmm. You mentioned buzzwords. I've heard the term uh, precautionary principle a mm -hmm. lot, and I know uh, Multnomah County has now sort of adopted that. So why don't you right. tell us a little bit about what, what that means and why it's mm -hmm. important and how it's going to be used? I would be happy to. The precautionary principle is, in a sense, a way to make decisions. And it's kind of like a, a thoughtful way to prevent harm to human health and the environment. And it's kind of like the old adage, better safe than sorry. So instead of proving that a chemical or a product um, is safe or harmful after it's been on the market and after we've already been using it, instead it's kind of like taking a step back and being um, more on the preventive side and more cautious about the kinds of products that we allow to go to market and how we develop them in the first place, kind of like what we were talking about with clean technology. Um, but is it even practical to prove that something's safe? For all organisms everywhere under all circumstances, how do you do that? That seems impractical. That's a really good question. And you know, the thing about the precautionary principle that I like so much and that I use in my work is that it sets in place a decision-making process, essentially. So it gets you asking some questions um, along the lines of, you know, what are the safest alternatives that I could be using as a component in this product or as an ingredient? And so it's a good way to uh, involve the public and the community in helping to make that decision. Um, also a good way to make sure that those decisions are being made transparently. And um, yeah, so better safe than sorry is definitely something that is getting included in some policies like the REACH policy we talked about before right. and a couple of local governments are starting to pick up on it now but again it's a really good decision making tool and can inform future policies. So they managed to get that through in Europe and it mm -hmm. sounds like you're trying to use it in Multnomah County but I can imagine there's going to be some resistance from major manufacturers who We'll ask the same question Darcy did about how do I prove that this is safe instead of having to prove it's damaged. Yeah. So. Well, uh, one of the mm -hmm. things that we're working on in Multnomah County particularly is uh, just on you know our own internal government operations. So really not trying to tackle community or, or businesses at this time, mm -hmm. but it's really helpful to take a look at what kinds of products are governments buying, um, what kinds of things are we using in our public facilities, and again, like I said, you know, asking those questions ahead of time, uh, shifting the burden of proof and to uh, manufacturers or onto vendors and just asking them say in requests for proposals you know give us some information about the safety of these products because we're really interested in the safety of our members of our community and also in our employees and so really trying to open up the dialogue to asking more of those questions and then also setting an intention for buying the, the least toxic and least harmful product if at all possible where it's feasible where they work well um, where they're cost competitive things mm -hmm. like that and have you found that you're changing out many products as a result of that? Well, uh, in my own work at the county, the toxics reduction strategy is kind of just getting started. We adopted it as a work plan last year, and we are starting out with a couple of things that are uh, a little bit more on the easy side, I'd say. We're trying to figure out ways to buy low mercury lamps for county facilities, and we're trying to figure out ways to um, limit access to the really strong disinfectants that are needed in some facilities, mm. but not for all. So it, it's definitely going be a process and it'll take a while to get through all those actions but we're learning a lot as we go and we're involving a lot of employees along the way so it's a good time. I would hope you'd make that information available once you figure out what is the product that's safer that if you start making that public then other people can pile on and and participate as well without having mm -hmm. to do all the research. It's a very collaborative process and I wanted to mention that there's also some good examples from the private sector. Um, there are some right. uh, businesses that are, are making kind of voluntary decisions before the new regulations change. You know, I think mm. we're, we're probably going to see a shift toward um, kind of more responsible policies in this country. But before that happens, we're seeing some companies um, like Patagonia choosing organic cotton, for instance, <clears throat> or um, some footwear companies are, are choosing to source less toxic products to make right. those shoes. There's also third-party certification programs like Green Seal, which have great standards built right into the seal that say that you know there won't be these types of toxic products in there. And they're vetted out with industry before the, the standards are adopted. And it, it's a voluntary thing that 
a manufacturer can put as a seal on their product. So it's a good way to, as a consumer, uh, either at home or at work, to try to find something that's, that's better. That does make it a lot easier for us when I go to the store to look mm -hmm. for something like Green Seal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Good. it makes such a difference to ask. Mm. I know we've had several clients mm. who, in doing an assessment for them, went and talked to some of their vendors or people who worked with them, and they'd say, oh, they're interested in sustainability. I could have given them mm. the green cleaning products. I could have give, given them the non-toxic paint. So the default is still yeah. to give people the toxic stuff because it's what people are used to using. So asking makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. So is there anything else locally that's going on that you'd like to share? Sure. Well, I wanted to talk about this grassroots effort called the Safe Cosmetics yes. Campaign. It's just a really, I think it's just a stellar example of a community effort that's really starting to make a difference. So they're working on um, both informing consumers on the types of um, chemicals, toxic chemicals that might be in personal care products, so things from lipstick to shampoo to lotions, um, deodorant, things like that. And uh, also they're working on a voluntary action by manufacturers to make those products safer. And they have a great website where you can get more information and they're also working really actively with different manufacturers to, mm -hmm. to try to educate them on why these products should be safer. And it's important because um, the FDA doesn't really have the tools right now to necessarily regulate all of the different ingredients so it's really important. Well that's a that's a fantastic lead in to our next mm -hmm. uh, spotlight. You're talking about personal care products and we'd like to take you to a company that cares very much about personal care products and it's the Oregon Soap Company. We have a sample of their product right here. They're producing products that are not only uh, safe for um, for you and me to use but also environmentally benign. So let's go with uh, Katie Woods out into the field and um, get a peek at what's happening at Oregon Soap Company. Well, hi, welcome. I'm Katie Wood, and today I am talking with Sat Atma from the Oregon Soap Company. Hi, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm doing good, Katie. How are you? I'm doing excellent, thanks. So, what separates you from the other soap companies? Well, there's a big difference between the soap that we make and the mass produced soaps. Um, the soap that uh, Procter and Gamble and you know the big soap makers uh, make is is based on animal fat and petroleum byproducts. Um, it, their soap takes about 72 hours to make, where we use something called the cold process. It's a five-week process. Uh, it makes the soap very, very mild, and they last much longer than ordinary soap. And in contrast to the other, like sort of small-scale soap makers um, that are you know our direct competitors. Um, we're um, using all organic vegetable oils and, and we don't use any synthetic fragrances or colors or anything. It's as organic as it uh, can be. All right. Well, I'm really excited to see how you make all of this. So, you want to show me? Are you all ready? Right, let's all right. Go. Let's go. All right. Well, here we are in our soap shop. We're going to make some soap today. We're going to make a peppermint soap here in this oil drum. And uh, over here we have all the essential oils that we use to make soap and the different herbs. We also use uh, an on-demand hot water heater. And this hot water heater only heats up water as we need it. So it uses just a very minimal amount of power. So what do we do first when we make soap? Well, first I have to put on my work clothes. All right, well, let's get changed then. So this is stage two in soap making, right? After we got our protective gear on? Right, uh, right here we have a, a pot of a vegetable oil. We make all of our soap out of organic vegetable oil instead of animal fat, uh, like most soap is made out of. These are all our trimmings uh, from our last batch of soap. So we're just gonna put this in the new batch and it'll reform real nicely into new soap. So that way you don't have any waste. There's almost no waste. Um, we use uh, almost every last little piece of soap um, actually, down at the Saturday market, we take all of our scraps and leftover odd-sized pieces um, that don't get turned into soap again, and people buy those. Right now, we're going to filter the oil and make sure that there's no big chunks of unmelted oil. You can actually make soap out of any kind of fat or oil. You know, then the old pioneers used to make it out of their bacon drippings and stuff like that. We use three oils, palm and coconut and olive oil. Palm oil just makes a really nice, good, solid soap. Coconut oil makes soap suds. And then the olive oil is great for your skin. 
All right, now we're gonna check our temperatures. With our particular formula, the lye and the vegetable oil need to be within three degrees of each other. So our lye is now at 87.5 degrees. Then we'll go over here and check out our vegetable oil. So our vegetable oil is now at 93.5 degrees. So we need to heat up our lye just a little bit more before we mix the two together. And all the scents all come from essential oils, which are plant-based as opposed to uh, synthetic fragrances, which are again, um, you know, chemical compounds that often have a, a difficult time biodegrading. So this is peppermint oil from the Yakima Valley up in Washington. It is a little more challenging using the essential oils than perfume oils because it, uh, most of our soaps are, are blends of two, three, or four, or five different essential oils, so it takes some time to get the blending right. You know, in the very beginning, we experimented a little bit with some of the perfume oils, and they just they gave me a headache to work with, and I didn't think they smelled good. And yeah, we figured out pretty early on that we just wanted to work with the plant-based. So we're gonna add our lye to our vegetable oil. As you can see, I got a face mask on because you don't want to get this in your eyes. And you can see the vegetable oils are already starting to change colors, getting thick and milky because it's turning into soap. So what is soap? How does it work? Soap is a very interesting molecule um, that's very long and skinny. And one side of the molecule um, sticks to dirt and grease, and the other side sticks to water. So basically when you're using soap, um, there's, it's like a, an electromagnetic bond that bonds the dirt to the water. And you know how when you put a drop of water on your skin, it just stays as a drop? Um, soap actually releases the tension between the water molecules so that the, the water and the soap can get down in, in your skin or in, in your clothing um, to get you clean. About a half a gallon of essential oil we put in there. So the soap's done. All right, so besides the uh, benefits it has for our skin, what type of impact does it have on the environment when you make it? Mother Nature already has mechanisms uh, built into it that will break down plant-based natural materials um, as opposed to synthetic ingredients, which are often very complex, big, long chemicals that Mother Nature has more of a difficult time breaking down. So just by the nature of the ingredients that we use, you know, they biodegrade much quicker than most products that are out there. By using your soap, you're also offsetting CO2 emissions because of the carbon offsetting. We work with a, a, a group called Carbon Fund. It's carbonfund.org. And you can get on the Carbon Fund and you can um, calculate your own carbon footprint. And so that, um, that the carbon that we're using in the production of the soap gets offset by the planting of, of trees is how I'm really into uh, forest uh, re reforestation projects. And, we actually aim to offset at least 150% of our, of our carbon usage. So instead of just being carbon neutral, I guess it would be carbon negative to where there's a little bit less carbon um, greenhouse gases that are produced, you know, that are out there um, when you buy a bar soap. Because I think that going carbon neutral at this point isn't enough. You know, we need to actually be reducing the greenhouse gases. Um, that we're creating, that's only going to happen by everybody actually taking out a little bit more than they're putting in. So we use renewable power and all the so in the soap shop as well, and and we offset our driving and our and our air travel that we have to do a couple times a year. And then what you can't reduce to nothing, then we offset. So this is the curing room, and this is where all the soap dries. Soap actually goes through a five-week process um, where it's curing. Um, here we have this big block of soap gets cut into these smaller pieces where they sit here for a couple weeks. Then they get trimmed up into bars like this. What happens in the curing process? During the curing process, the water um, evaporates from the soap, which makes it harder and more long-lasting. And the chemistry of the soap uh, actually takes that long to complete to actually turn this into a, a bar of pure soap. So now we're going to take this 200-pound block of soap and cut it into bricks, right? Yes. All right, let's cut some soap. All right. So 
first we're just taking the sides off, right? Yeah, we're gonna take... Expose the block. Right. So how many different kinds of essence are there, soaps do you make? We currently make uh, 22 different kinds of soap, of bar soap, and then we're in the process of making liquid soap as well, and then we have about three different kinds of liquid soap. So right now it's just body soap? Do you make like a facial soap or hand soap? or? Uh, there's one of those scents that works really great for the hands. It's a cinnamon soap that's really good for like cutting grease and dirt. and. Um, and then they all work pretty good for the face. There's one in particular called Honey and Oatmeal Soap, which is a, a particularly good face soap. What's your favorite? I like the Bay Rum. The Bay Rum? Yeah. Um, what do you find is the most popular? Uh, lavender is definitely the most popular soap. Yeah, that is always a popular fragrance. Yeah. This big bar of soap, which is kind of odd shaped, and you can see has lots of, lots of soap left over on the top. A piece like this will actually get taken to the Saturday market and we'll sell it in our scrap soap area, which everybody loves because they're like half price. So we just use some tools that a friend of mine made for us and we shave off the top of the soap. And we'll throw these on a screen here to dry out as to well. Dry out as well. These tools are nice because they really make the soap the same size. Yeah. So this is the final cut. We're going to turn this big brick of soap um, into 16 small bars of soap. Uh huh. Is this another homemade piece of machine? Yeah, it's another homemade piece of soap cool. equipment. Now these are going to cure for five weeks. I'd like them not to touch so the air can circulate between them. Um, looks great. All right. So the final process of making soap is the packaging, correct? That's correct. Um, our favorite way to sell soap is actually with no packaging and people come into the stores and just cut off however much they want. Save a few trees that way. Yeah, save a few trees. Um, we also sell it uh, with our minimal packaging that just has a simple wrap around, it's called a cigar band label on it. Or uh, some of the grocery stores like to have it boxed up so we have a nice box that the soap goes into. And you do all of this yourself, right? Just Well, this is the soap elves do lots the of this. soap elves. Yeah, they do the soap they wrapping. I'm going to wrap one myself here. Okay. That way I can be considered an elf. Well, Sat Atma, thank you so much for showing us around and making soap with me. I had a great time. All right. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, of course. And I'm Katie Wood with Sustainable Today, bringing you tools today to make you more sustainable. Well, thanks so much to Oregon Soap for giving us such a wonderful bar. I'm hoping that we can split this up amongst us and take some of it home. It smells wonderful. I think most people don't realize that when you, you know, everything that goes down your drain ends up in the river, and so it matters what, what you wash your hair with, mm. what you wash your body with, drain cleaners, all those mm. things. So we always like to, at this part of the show, tell, tell our viewers what they can do at home and at work to make a difference and obviously switch to non-toxic or bio-based products that will help a lot and there are cleaning products, personal care products, weed and pest control, there's something in almost every product category. If you can't find it at your store, ask for non-toxic products to let your vendors know that you care. When you buy furnishings, look for non-toxic furnishings and building uh, materials. Uh, watch out in particularly for flame retardants or stain, you know, stuff that's covered to, to keep <coughs> stains off, things like that. Use the products as they are directed. Actually read the instructions, follow the instructions, and dispose of the materials properly. A lot of uh, homeowners don't measure things carefully, and so mm -hmm. that can lead to all sorts of problems. 
research your purchases. We're going to give you at the end of the show a bunch of great websites that will help you research your pur purchases. Since another way that you can um, uh, protect yourself and your family is to buy organic food, you can radically reduce the amount of pesticides that you're ingesting by doing that. So those are things that you can do at home. Marsha, what are things that people can do at work? Well, even in the workplace, uh, there are some obvious things like starting a recycling system uh, for uh, chemical products. Um, some of the companies that we've worked with have even enabled their employees to bring some of those difficult to recycle things to work like batteries and thermometers and so accepting them in a central location, I'm getting a nod from Molly so it must be a good idea. Uh, obviously asking your janitorial service to switch to greener cleaning products. Um, if you remodel for your business to consider low VOC paints and, and fabrics without the flame retardants, those kinds of things, you, you can ask your architect or your contractor about them. They should know. Um, if they don't know, perhaps you need a different architect or contractor. Um, doing a chemical inventory in, um, you know, even if you're not a manufacturer, likely you're using chemicals in your business, if nothing else, toners, uh, and printer inks, things like that and making sure that you have the material safety data sheets available and read them because they're fairly informative. Um, you can also vet your chemical list or your, the things that you're using. We, we've worked with organizations that create what they call blacklists and gray lists. The blacklists are the chemicals that they're trying to phase out uh, using native plants and also an environmentally preferable purchasing product. So, Molly, mm. you've identified a bunch of great websites, so t quickly tell us about them. Oh, I'd love to. Well, you know, it's really mm. easy if you have access to the Internet these days to really become in informed and educate yourself on a couple of these different things. And it doesn't have to be scary because most of the websites actually do give you some ideas for things that you can do in your everyday life to reduce your exposure to toxics. So I wanted to bring your attention to a couple um, Let's see, healthycar.org is brand new if you're going to be buying a car. It has oh, to do with the toxic chemicals that are in new cars. New car smell, not such a good thing. <laughs> um, if you're looking for information about a specific toxic chemical, you can go to scorecard.org. That's always a, a good one mm -hmm. to look things up. And there's a new one along the same lines called Toxipedia, kind of like Wikipedia, but uh -huh. all about toxics for us toxics nerds out there. And <laughs> for kind of the everyday person, if you're just interested in a little bit more information, I would suggest a couple of great websites that are on the National Institute of Health website. One's called Tox Town, and it's this interactive map. You can find out where toxics are in an everyday community and also tox map where you can kind of look up in your own community Ew. what the concerns might be. More than you ever may want to know. Huh? <laughs> and then there's the Safe Cosmetics uh, website as well, right? That's right. I believe it's safecosmetics.org and there are also other ones that are for personal care products specifically and if you're most interested in health you can check out um, healthandenvironment.org. It's good, too. Thank you. Well, we want to thank you again for being with us tonight. It was a fascinating show, and hopefully our viewers picked up some things that they um, can start doing to become more sustainable today. And we hope you'll join us uh, for our next couple of shows. This summer we're featuring food since it's going to be harvest season. So thank you all for joining us. Hope you learned something. We'll see you next month. There's a big, beautiful planet in the sky It's my home, it's where I live You and many others live here too The earth is our home, it's where we live We can feel the power of the noonday sun A blazing ball of fire up above Shining light and warmth enough for everyone A gift to every nation from a star There's a big, beautiful planet in the sky It's my home, it's where I live You and many others live here too The earth is our home